from Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! President Obama said the biggest threat to our country is global warming. That's cool. Give me a break, okay? The biggest threat to our country is nuclear, and we cannot let Iran get a nuclear weapon. After campaigning on a platform of denying climate change, Donald Trump has tapped a climate change denier to head the Environmental Protection Agency, Oklahoma Attorney General Scott Pruitt. This is the same man accused by The New York Times of orchestrating an unprecedented secretive alliance with the nation's top energy producers to fight Obama's climate efforts. We'll get response from 350.org and Food and Water Watch. Then, faithless electors. We'll speak with the Texas Republican member of the Electoral College who's publicly announced he will not vote for Donald Trump. Could this be the start of a rebellion within the Republican Party? And as a judge orders an end to the Michigan election recount, we'll speak with John Boniface, founder of the National Voting Rights. All that and more, coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. President-elect Donald Trump has announced he'll nominate Oklahoma Attorney General Scott Pruitt to head the Environmental Protection Agency. Pruitt's been one of the EPA's fiercest critics and has led a legal effort to overturn parts of President Obama's climate change policies, including his Clean Power Plan. Pruitt claimed the science of climate change is far from settled. He's also seen as a close ally of the fossil fuel industry. In 2014, The New York Times revealed Pruitt and other Republican attorneys general had formed what the paper described as an unprecedented secretive alliance with the nation's top energy producers to fight Obama's climate efforts. The Times also exposed Pruitt's close ties to the Oklahoma firm Devon Energy. In 2014, Pruitt sent the EPA a letter accusing federal regulators of overestimating the amount of air pollution caused by energy companies drilling new natural gas wells in Oklahoma. What Pruitt did not reveal was that the letter was secretly drafted by lawyers at Devon Energy. Senator Bernie Sanders Sanders said, quote, Pruitt's record is not only that of being a climate change denier, but also someone who has worked closely with the fossil fuel industry to make this country more dependent, not less, on fossil fuels, unquote. We'll have more on Attorney General Pruitt after headlines. Donald Trump also announced he's picked retired four-star Marine General John Kelly to be the Secretary of Homeland Security. Kelly was formerly the head of the United States Southern Command, where he oversaw the military jail at Guantanamo Bay. Margaret Huang, executive director of Amnesty International USA, said of Kelly, quote, "...we're particularly concerned that, while chief of U.S. Southern Command, Kelly oversaw Guantanamo during periods of extensive hunger strikes and force-feeding that was unsafe and inhumane," unquote. Kelly has repeatedly testified to Congress, saying the U.S.-Mexico border represents a threat to national security, leading many to worry he'll escalate the militarization of the border and U.S. immigration policy overall. While the head of United States Southern Command, Kelly also promoted the Alliance for Prosperity, a program that provides hundreds of millions of dollars in police and military funding to Honduras, El Salvador and Guatemala. The program has been criticized by human rights activists and some Democratic lawmakers who are calling for the suspension of this funding to Honduras until the country addresses its gross human rights violations. Kelly retired from the military in 2015. He's the third general Trump has picked for top positions so far. The other two are retired Lieutenant General Mike Flynn for National Security Advisor and retired Marine Corps General James Mattis for Defense Secretary. Donald Trump attacked union leader Chuck Jones on Twitter Wednesday after Jones appeared on CNN criticizing Trump for breaking his promise to carrier workers in Indiana. Last week, Trump appeared at the Carrier Air Conditioner plant in Indianapolis and boasted he'd saved 1,100 jobs from being moved to Mexico. But Jones, who represents the workers, says Trump, quote, lied his off, unquote. Jones says Trump helped keep only 730 jobs in the U.S., not 1,100. In response to Jones' criticism, Trump tweeted, quote, Chuck Jones, who is president of United Steelworkers 1999, has done a terrible job representing workers. No wonder companies flee the country, unquote. 
In Syria, government forces are continuing to seize control of parts of eastern Aleppo, as the U.S. and Russia are negotiating a potential deal to allow anti-government rebels to flee. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov is slated to meet with Secretary of State John Kerry today. The rescue organization, the White Helmets, says 61 people died Wednesday amid shelling and airstrikes in rebel-held areas, as government forces seized control of Aleppo's old city. Medical doctors and other protesters gathered outside the Russian embassy in Berlin Wednesday to denounce Russian and Syrian bombing in Aleppo. Ja, um gegen die, uh, um gegen die Kriegsverbrechen. I am here to protest against the war crimes committed by Russia and Syria in Aleppo. We believe it's outrageous that the world is watching how mass killings are taking place and no one says anything. Wieder ein Massenmord passiert und keiner sagt was. In Indonesia, a 6.5 magnitude earthquake has killed more than 100 people after striking the northern tip of Sumatra Island Wednesday, while many residents were sleeping. At least 700 more have been injured and thousands have been displaced. Wednesday's earthquake is the worst disaster to hit the region since 2004, when a tsunami killed more than 120,000 people in the province. In the Philippines, the death toll from President Rodrigo Duterte's so-called war on drugs continues to rise. Police have killed at least 2,000 people, and vigilantes have killed at least 3,500 more since Duterte took office this summer. Tens of thousands more have been arrested or turned themselves over to police out of fear they'll be killed. Human rights groups say many of those killed have been summarily shot and had nothing to do with the drug trade. On Wednesday, the White House condemned the ex judicial killings in the Philippines. But a recent BuzzFeed investigation reveals the U.S. State Department has continued to send millions of dollars in aid, as well as training and equipment, to the Philippine National Police. Meanwhile, Philippines President Rodrigo Duterte gave an impression of his December 2nd phone call with Donald Trump while speaking Wednesday. He imitated Trump praising Duterte and appealing for a closer relationship between the two men. Oh. President Duterte, oh, you should fix our bad relations. It needs a, a lot of, uh, you know, you just set something good here. And you're doing great. I, I know what you're, you, you worry about uh, these Americans criticizing you. You're doing good. Go ahead. I had this problem in, in, the, in the border of Mexico and America and this goddamn guy. So ngayon, mga kinig ka kira, magsalita sa akin, naging santo ako. That's Philippines President Rodrigo Duterte speaking in Tagalog, saying, so now the way he speaks makes me feel like a saint, in reference to Donald Trump. In Yemen, thousands of people took to the streets of the capital, Sana'a, on Tuesday to demand an end to the U.S.-backed Saudi-led bombing campaign, which has killed thousands of people since it began 19 months ago. A new Human Rights Watch report details how U.S.-supplied weapons were used in two recent Saudi airstrikes that killed several dozen civilians this fall. The attacks include a September 10 airstrike against a drilling site for water that killed more than 30 people, including three children. Remnants of U.S.-made weapons were found at the scene of the strike. In Charleston, South Carolina, testimony has begun in the trial of Dylan Roof, who faces the death penalty. He's accused of opening fire at the Emanuel AME Church in June 2015, killing nine black worshipers, including the pastor, Clementa Pinckney. Roof embraced white supremacist views and was shown in photographs posing with a Confederate flag and a pistol. On Wednesday, the first witness in the trial, Felicia Sanders, says she watched as Roof pulled out a Glock 45 caliber handgun and began shooting, striking and wounding her son and killing her aunt. She says she took cover underneath a table with her 11-year-old granddaughter and tried to cover herself and the girl in other people's blood, so Roof would think they were already dead. A new report has accused the U.S. Border Patrol Agency of using the desert of the borderlands as a weapon that's led to the death or disappearances of tens of thousands of people since the 1990s. 
The report, issued by the group's No More Deaths and the Coalition of Human Rights, accuses Border Patrol of intentionally promoting deadly apprehension policies, such as chasing people into remote areas of the desert that led to migrants' deaths or disappearances. This is Alicia Dinsmore of No More Deaths, recounting one such story. On the night of March 6, 2015, Jose Cesario Aguilar Esparza and his two nephews were crossing through the U.S.-Mexico borderlands in the desert southeast of Ajo, Arizona, when U.S. Border Patrol agents detected their group and began chasing them. During the chase, the three men became separated. Border Patrol agents arrested two of them, but Jose Cesario was unaccounted for. Later, it was discovered that he had fallen off a cliff nearly 200 feet down and died. The report says, quote, the known disappearance of thousands of people in the remote wilderness of the U.S.-Mexico border zone marks one of the great historical crimes of our day, unquote. In Texas, two private detention centers continue to hold migrant women and children seeking asylum, even after the judge barred the state from licensing them as child care facilities. The state has appealed the ruling. For-profit prison companies Geo Group and Core Civic, formerly known as CCA, insist they're in compliance with federal standards. Immigration authorities say operational activities continue without interruption. But advocates reported that after the ruling on Friday, nearly 500 women and children were released, with almost no advance notice to local shelters that usually handle dozens of people. They told Democracy Now! they expect another mass release in the coming days. Even with the releases, there are currently an estimated 600 women and children in the Carnes Detention Center and another 1,800 held at a detention camp in Dilly, both about an hour south of San Antonio, Texas. The American Civil Liberties Union has sued the U.S. Customs and Border Protection Agency over its refusal to provide complete records of stops and detentions in Michigan. The entire state of Michigan is designated as part of Homeland Security's 100-mile zone, meaning Border Patrol agents have wide powers to engage in warrantless stops. The ACLU of Michigan said, quote, it's not reasonable to claim that the entire state of Michigan is a border zone. Border enforcement and the powers that go with it belongs at the border and not in our communities, they said. In Washington, D.C., Minnesota State House Representative Ilan Omar says she was attacked by a cab driver who called her ISIS and threatened to rip off her hijab as she was leaving a policy training at the White House. Omar recently made history by becoming the nation's first Somali-American lawmaker. She wrote on Facebook Wednesday, that the attack was, quote, the most hateful, derogatory, Islamophobic, sexist taunts and threats I've ever experienced. She said, I'm still shaken by this incident and can't wrap my head around how bold people are becoming in displaying their hate towards Muslims, unquote. Portland's city council has voted to impose additional taxes on companies whose CEOs earn more than 100 times the median pay of their workers. The Oregon measure, which Portland officials say is the first in the nation, targets and penalizes companies that perpetuate income inequality. Portland Mayor Charlie Hale said, quote, income inequality is real. It's a national problem, and the federal government isn't doing anything about it, unquote. And prominent Palestinian activist Rasmia Oda has won a new trial. Oda was convicted of immigration fraud in 2014, then sentenced to 18 months in prison and deportation from the United States for failing to disclose her conviction on bombing charges by an Israeli military court more than 40 years ago. Oda says her conviction was obtained through weeks of torture and sexual assault in Israeli custody. She's lived in the United States for more than 20 years. Her supporters say she was targeted over her support for Palestinian liberation. Her new trial is slated to begin in Michigan in January. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Nermeen Sheikh. Welcome to our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. President-elect Donald Trump has announced he will nominate Oklahoma Attorney General Scott Pruitt to head the Environmental Protection Agency. Pruitt has been one of the EPA's fiercest critics and has led a legal effort to overturn parts of President Obama's climate change policies, including his Clean Power Plan. Pruitt claimed the science of climate change is, quote, 
far from settled. He is also seen as a close ally of the fossil fuel industry. In 2014, The New York Times revealed that Pruitt and other Republican attorneys general had formed what the paper described as a, quote, unprecedented secretive alliance with the nation's top energy producers to fight Obama's climate efforts. The New York Times also exposed Pruitt's close ties to the Oklahoma firm Devon Energy. In 2014, Pruitt sent the EPA a letter accusing federal regulators of overestimating the amount of air pollution caused by energy companies drilling new natural gas wells in Oklahoma. What Pruitt didn't reveal was that the letter was secretly drafted by lawyers at Devon Energy. In 2015, Pruitt testified before Congress about his opposition to the EPA's Clean Power Plan regulations. When questioned by Democratic Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, Pruitt refuse to acknowledge the existence of climate change. Is climate change a problem anywhere in the world? Uh, Senator, I think that the process matters that the EPA engages in to address these issues. And uh, but that's I, I didn't ask you a process question. I asked you a question about whether climate change I think that is a real question, problem anywhere in the world. I think the question about uh, climate action plan of the president, climate change, is something that's a policy consideration of this Congress. If you want EPA to address that in a direct way, you can amend the Clean Air Act to provide that authority and the statutory power to do so, so that the states can know how to conduct themselves in a way that is con con consistent with st statutory construction. So to be uh, that's clear, not, that's not neither of the attorney generals present will concede that climate change is a real problem anywhere in the world. Senator, I think it's immaterial to discussions about the legal framework of the Clean Air Act. Immaterial or not, I get to ask questions, and so it's material to my question. All right, let's go on to something else. Democratic Senator Sheldon Whitehouse questioning Oklahoma Attorney General Scott Pruitt last year. Trump's selection of Pruitt to head the EPA has been widely criticized by environmental groups and lawmakers concerned about the climate change crisis. Senator Bernie Sanders said, quote, Pruitt's record is not only that of being a climate change denier, but also someone who has worked closely with the fossil fuel industry to make this country more dependent, not less, on fossil fuels. Environmental Working Group President Ken Cook said, quote, it's a safe assumption that Pruitt could be the most hostile EPA administrator toward clean air and safe drinking water in history. To talk more about Scott Pruitt, we're joined by two guests. Here in New York, May Bouvi is with us, executive director of 350 Action, the political arm of the climate organization 350.org. And joining us from Washington, D.C., is Winona Howder. She is executive director of Food and Water Act. Uh, watch. Winona, let us begin with you. Oklahoma's Attorney General Scott Pruitt tapped to head the EPA. Your response? Well, you know, I first ran into Scott Pruitt when I was writing my recent book, Fracopoly, on the history of the oil and gas industry, and saw that he was one of the leading attorney generals lobbying on what he called sue and settle legislation which we know that our citizenry has the right to sue the federal government when the government is not doing what's in their best interest. And in, he was lobbying in favor of Devon and Continental Resources in trying to stop the ability of citizens to actually move forward with lawsuits. I think that putting Pruitt in charge of the EPA is a lot like putting one of the Three Stooges in charge of the agency, because he is not really credible on any of the issues around the environment. We can look at what he did in 2013, when he brought nine attorney generals to Oklahoma City, some of the most powerful uh, law firms that represent the energy industry, along with the CEOs of many energy companies to put together a scheme about how they were going to stop the federal government from taking action to stop the pollution from fossil fuel drilling and fracking. This was paid for by the right-wing uh, Energy and Law Institute at George Mason University. The fossil fuel industry actually helped 
raised the money to put him in office. And one of the first things he did upon becoming the attorney general of Oklahoma was to start a, a committee on federalism. Because what's unfortunate about Pruitt is not only is he a cartoon character, but he's a very smart politician. And he saw the possibility of creating what is a lot like a national law firm made up of attorney generals and also uh, the, the legal arm of the energy industry to be able to not only hassle the EPA, but also what was going on at state legislatures regarding uh, fossil fuel development. So I think he's a very dangerous character. I think that he is going to attempt to destroy the Environmental Protection Agency, and not just in the area of fossil fuels, but also around the pollution from factory farming and industrialized agriculture. He has been an ally of the big corporations that own uh, these large animal factories. And, in fact, there was uh, legislation that was uh, turned down in Oklahoma in the last uh, election called Freedom to Farm, which, of course, really means freedom of uh, factory farms to pollute. Um, so we know that because the EPA hasn't done a real great job of regulating factory farms anyway, that we're going to see a lot of trouble ahead. May Bouvi, uh, in the news release that announced uh, his nomination, the Trump transition team called Pruitt an expert in constitutional law and said he, quote, brings a deep understanding of the impact of regulations on both the environment and the economy. So could you respond to that, and in particular the significance of him being a constitutional lawyer? Well, it's no surprise that he knows about the impact of regulation, because the regulations were starting to work. We were starting to see real pressure on the oil and gas industry on the issue of climate change. And they are pushing back. And so they are celebrating that Scott Pruitt has been selected for this role. So his expertise in this area means he's going to try to dismantle the foundation of laws that this country has built around environmental protection. Most significantly right now are the regulations that have been put in place around coal plants, around fracking. They're not nearly as strong as they need to be, but we certainly need the ones that we have. And so this is a very dangerous appointment. It cannot be overstated. And it shows us exactly what we need to know about Donald Trump. I want to go back to Oklahoma Attorney General Scott Pruitt's appearance on Capitol Hill in 2015, when he testified about his legal fight against President Obama's Clean Power Plan regulations. Uh, I think what is lost in the debate at times is the impact on consumers, those that will be consuming electricity in the future. In the state of Oklahoma, uh, between coal and natural gas, 78 percent of our electricity is generated. Uh, as I indicated in my opening comment, 15 percent of our electricity is generated through wind. Uh, the choices available to the state of Oklahoma to comply with this uh, mandate from the EPA of reducing CO2 by th over 30 percent, it puts us in a position of having to make decisions about the shuttering of coal generation, which, as I indicated, makes up over 40 percent of our electricity generation. That's going to increase costs substantially to consumers. Just one rule, to give you an example. Uh, in the Clean Air Act, there is something called the Regional Haze Statute, as you know, section of the Clean Air Act. That one rule alone between PSO, Public Service Company of Oklahoma, and OG&E in the state of Oklahoma have seen 15 to 20 percent increases in their generation of electricity with just one rule. When we combine all these others, it's going to be, obviously, substantially more than that in the future for consumers in the state of Oklahoma. So these regulations would directly hurt, hurt the people of Oklahoma? Some of the folks that can least afford it. So there you have Scott Pruitt testifying before the Senate. Uh, Winona Howder, uh, respond to what Pruitt has just said. Well, this is really a false dichotomy that we see all the time when energy is discussed. Really, what we need to do is be moving into a more energy efficient and a, an energy future that relies on renewable energy. This would create many jobs 
and it would also solve many of the problems that are going to cost taxpayers a lot of money as we see the problems from climate change really snowball. You know, it's interesting that Pruitt um, and his allies have attacked the Clean Power Plan. I don't think that they completely understand what the plan does. They, uh, it certainly disadvantages coal, which is the a very, very dirty fossil fuel, but states are able to make their own plans. And one of the criticisms of the plan has been that it really incentivizes natural gas. And, of course, coal is being um, the industry is being destroyed because the amount of fossil fuel that has been uh, fracked for has increased so much that it's real that coal is um, now a, a higher price. So I think that uh, what we're going to see at EPA is a real attack on anything that protects people or the environment. And this is really disturbing, because attorney generals are supposed to be the attorneys for the people. And Pruitt clearly is an attorney for the fossil fuel industry. And we're going to have to unite against Pruitt and the policies that he's going to put forward. Um, <clears throat> you talked about fracked oil, and uh, I wanted to talk specifically about Oklahoma, where residents have filed a class action lawsuit against fracking companies over a massive 5.0 magnitude earthquake that struck the city of Cushing in November, knocking out power, rupturing gas lines, partially collapsing buildings. Cushing bills itself as the pipeline crossroads of the world, and it's home to above ground tanks that store millions of barrels of crude oil. Scientists believe wastewater disposal wells from oil and gas fracking are linked to the dramatic rise in earthquakes in Oklahoma in recent years. Oklahoma experienced 907 magnitude 3-plus earthquakes in 2015. Before 2008, Oklahoma experienced an average of only one in two earthquakes of 3.0 magnitude each year. Your response to that, May Boovey? Well, this is very telling about what we're going to see more of. Recently, we heard from the chief of the Pawnee Reservation that they'd had three earthquakes that day. So the earthquake epidemic in Oklahoma is significant, and here we have someone who wants to do more drilling, who wants there to be more earthquakes in Oklahoma, so is clearly not concerned about the people who live in that state and all the people in other states around this country who suffer from the impacts of fracking. Instead, he is going to make the pathway to more oil and gas development much smoother for his allies in the industry. But the good news here, if there is any, is that the climate movement has focused on fossil fuel infrastructure and won incredible victories at the local and state level. And so, if he intends to expand drilling, we will be there at every turn, ready to resist. So what do you think the climate movement should be doing now in response to this? Well, we have to be incredibly clear-eyed about what we are up against. As we know, Trump has been saying two different stories about climate change. On the one hand, maybe he's revisiting his position on climate denial. On the other hand, he's making an appointment like this. So no one should be under any illusion that we're going to see any sort of continuation of the progress we've seen on climate action. What the movement needs to do is be strong and unified and fight back on all of these decisions and appointments. And also, we can grow our movement. So many people who are concerned about the election of Donald Trump are concerned about what it means for this issue that is going to affect generations ha that have yet to come. And so we're seeing many more people who want to get involved, who want to do more, who want to organize and march. That is what they will do. And so Scott Pruitt better get ready for that. Well, of course, Scott Pruitt is Donald Trump's choice, and that's what's key here, is his view on climate, on the environment. Uh, May Boovey, uh, one of the a couple of the choices that have been bandied about, uh, media speculated about for S uh, Secretary of State, are the current and past presidents of Exxon. Can you talk about Scott Pruitt's relationship with Exxon um, as Attorney General of Oklahoma? Well. On the subject of appointments, it's absolutely devastating that the CEO of Exxon would be considered for secretary of state, just to be completely clear they about that. They talk about him. That means he has global experience. He's yeah, a global company. Yeah, of course. It's 
absolutely disastrous as even an idea. But in terms of Scott Pruitt's relationship to Exxon, he joined forces with other attorneys general backing up Exxon when it came under fire for its climate denial. There is an investigation underway into just how long ago Exxon knew about climate change and funded a disinformation campaign. And so, naturally, our government is doing its job and trying to find out how much they knew and when, and Exxon has gathered around it its allies at the state level, including Attorney General Scott Pruitt, to back it up. And so we're seeing Exxon try to use its freedom of speech to lie to the public about climate change, and we're seeing climate deniers heading up for the EPA. We're living in some kind of twilight zone. How does Exxon affect you at 350? Well, Exxon has come after our organization and a number of our allies. We've received one subpoena from Lamar Smith, who is a representative from the state of Texas, and we've received another subpoena from Exxon directly. And we are fighting back. But this is the kind of thing we can all expect to see more of under a Trump administration. We have to fight back. but. They are not playing around. Um, this news from Greenpeace, uh, Harold Hamm, Trump's top energy advisor and CEO of the country's largest fracking company, was chair of Pruitt's 2013 reelection campaign for Oklahoma attorney general. More recently, he's made news as one of the biggest proponents of the Dakota Access Pipeline. It's his company's fracked oil that would have flowed through the pipeline if it had been completed. Uh, Winona Howder, if you could talk about this. Now, Donald Trump has vowed um, to says he supports the Dakota Access Pipeline, not clear how much he personally has invested in the Dakota Access Pipeline. Last we knew, between half a million and a million dollars. Um, and But one of his spokespeople said he's now sold that. Then there is his investment in Phillips 66 that would also profit. Um, but what this means uh, for uh, what Trump, when he becomes president, uh, Attorney General Scott Pruitt, if he were to become head of the APA, means for the Dakota Access Pipeline, which, at this point, the Army Corps of Engineers says will not grant a uh, final permit to drill under the Missouri River. Has also been an advisor on energy issues to the Trump campaign, and they've been associated for the last several years. So we can um, see that when Trump comes into office, he is going to probably try to attack what President Obama has done on the um, Dakota Access Line. And we can see that there's really an unholy alliance here. Harold Hamm's company, Continental Resources, is one of the largest frackers for oil. And, of course, 80 percent of fracking since 2012 has been for oil, and much of it from the Dakotas. And the industry is desperate to get the oil out for overseas uh, delivery, and that's why the export ban was released uh, as part of the omnibus uh, budget bill in 2015. So we see that there's going to have to be a concerted effort to make the connections between these fossil fuel corporations and the Trump administration very clear, and we're going to have to hammer it home. I also want to see that I think that Standing Rock and the massive movement that's been created out of this um, terrible debacle that the fossil fuel industry has tried to um, um, bring to um, the Sioux tribe in North Dakota, um, we're seeing that kind of infrastructure development all over the country. There are thousands of miles of pipelines. We can make a lot of progress at the state level on some of these issues, and it's completely true what Mai says about the movement growing. The movement is growing. We need to be there during the process for um, confirming Pruitt and really bringing to light what he stands for 
and what is going to happen to our environment and our climate May, I want to just it. ask very quickly of May Bouvi, uh, the a lot has been made of this meeting that uh, President-elect Donald Trump has had with um, his daughter Ivanka and Al Gore on the issue of climate change. Respond. Well, he can have all the meetings he wants that make it sound like he cares about this issue. But if he makes appointments like this, we know exactly where he stands, which is supporting more drilling, more fracking, which we know causes climate change. We're going to leave it there. May Bouvi, executive director of 350 Action, Winona Howder, executive director of Food and Water Watch, thanks so much for being with us. When we come back, a faithless elector. Stay with us. There's got to be some reason for all this misery. A secret evil corporation somewhere overseas. They're pulling strings, arranging things. It's a conspiracy. Oh, what about the ones who shaped the course of history? What if we petition for one grand apology? I'll write to my prime minister, you write your president. Problem by Down Here. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. A Republican member of the Electoral College has come out saying he will not vote for President-elect Donald Trump when the Electoral College convenes on December 19th. Christopher Supran, a paramedic from Texas, wrote in an op-ed published in The New York Times on Monday that Trump is, quote, not qualified for the office of the presidency. He goes on to write, quote, The election of the next president is not yet a done deal. Electors of conscience can still do the right thing for the good of the country. President electors have the legal right and a constitutional duty to vote their conscience. Supran is the first Republican member of the Electoral College to publicly announce he won't vote for Trump. But there are reports of other so-called faithless electors. Meanwhile, a group of Democratic electors is trying to block Trump by encouraging electors of both parties in every state to unite behind a yet-to-be-determined consensus Republican candidate. They've dubbed themselves the Hamilton electors, after founding father Alexander Hamilton, who they say intended the Electoral College to safeguard the presidency. This is Democrat Brett Chaffalo, a Hamilton elector from Washington. The Electoral College is our fail-safe mechanism. And no, we've never used it before, but our country has never needed it before. We have always elected experienced statesmen, but this time is different. This is the moment Hamilton and Madison warned us about. This is the emergency they built the Electoral College for, and it is our constitutional duty and our moral responsibility to put the emergency measures into action. If only 37 Republican electors change their vote, Donald Trump will not have the 270 electoral votes he needs to be president. 37 patriots can save this country. Electors are typically selected by their state's party leaders. According to Fair Vote, 29 states have laws forbidding electors from bucking the will of their voters. However, 21, including Texas, have no binding restrictions. Historically, it's extremely rare for electors to dissent, and so far, no elector has changed the outcome of an election by voting against his or her party's designated candidate. For more, we're going to Dallas, Texas, where we're joined by Christopher Supran. His piece, Why I Will Not Cast My Electoral Vote for Donald Donald Trump appeared in The New York Times Monday. Christopher Supran, welcome to Democracy Now! So, talk about how you came to this decision. Well, painfully, I had intended to support the nominee, but unfortunately, Mr. Trump has proven again and again he is not qualified for the office. 
He is a complete demagogue, as we've seen uh, for the past 18 months, up till last night, where he picked on a steel worker who had to say something about his jobs plan for Carrier. It, that's a scary thought. When you're a simple steel worker, union uh, boss, there at a factory in Indiana, you question the president, and he comes after you 30 minutes later. I'm not sure what the president's going to do when North Korea says something even worse about him in international relations, which brings up the second reason why he's not qualified. Fifty of my Republican colleagues, who are national security and foreign policy experts, said Mr. Trump would be a danger if he were president. And we've already seen that, where he has uh, exacerbated situations in Taiwan and China with his uh, change on the one China policy, or what appears to be a change. And then beyond that, part of the issue with Taiwan was it appeared to be a sales call. Mr. Trump cannot profit off the office of the president. It's expressly forbidden by the Emoluments Clause. And it appears every time he calls another country, it's to sell a Trump property. And Christopher Supran, can you talk about what the response has been uh, to your decision uh, not uh, to support Trump? Well, which response? Because there's certainly feedback saying, I'm an awful person, I'm a traitor. I saw a tweet a little while ago that said I should uh, live out the rest of my life at Gitmo, uh, which is a scary thought that when a person takes a conscious decision to vote their conscience, that our answer is to charge them with treason, even verbally. But the other feedback I've received from across Texas, from across my county, from across the country and even outside the country has been positive. I've had Americans of all shape and form come to me and say, you've restored my faith in America that maybe we can still be that great country we should be. So talk about how it works. What will happen on December 19th? Where do you go and what will you do? Sure. Electors from each state will go to their respective state capital. They will then cast ballots. Uh, I believe it's a six-page form. Uh, each ballot goes to a different person. And you write in a name. It's not like a typical ballot at the ballot box in a November election, where you have to check a box, as I understand it. This is my first time participating in the process. But you actually write in a name for that candidate you are electing president and then vice president. And how were you selected, Christopher Supran? How were you selected to join the Electoral College? I was elected at the Republican State Convention in May. So the Republican, correct, the Texas Republican State Convention. I want to make sure that's clear, not the national. Mm -hmm. Twenty-nine states have laws forbidding electors from bucking the will of the people of the state. Texas is not one of them. Uh, Texas is one of the 21 that have no binding restrictions. So explain how it works for you when you um, uh, will vote not for President Trump, um, and how it works for others in other states. Well, I think, again, as I just described, I think I'm going to place a name of a person who I think has got great executive and legislative uh, experience and that can unite the country. I think we are going to uh, go through a basic process. I'm not entirely sure of what that is. The Secretary of State, as I understand it, will provide us that information we are, when we arrive that morning. Uh, in terms of other states, I think they have a similar process, though I'm not sure uh, how they are going to be different and what the binding laws are going to if they're even going to exist. As you mentioned, there's a lawsuit, I believe, in Colorado to overturn that function. Who are you going to vote for? I don't know. I'm in a deliberations phase. I said uh, in my op-ed that I think John Kasich would be a great person. And while I know he's declined it, for me, when I speak to other electors, there's one name that comes up as an acceptable alternative over and over, and that's John Kasich. And do so you... I'm not sure who that person's going to be, but I think they'll be like Mr. Governor Kasich. Do you know of other Republican electors who are likely to join you on December 19th in opposing Trump? I'm not sure I'm ready to say that at this point. Uh, when I wrote the op-ed, it was so that I could be accountable for my vote, because I didn't want to go to Austin and uh, cast a vote of appeasement and simply write in Donald Trump uh, because I was lazy. But since that time, I've had a number of people reach out to me. And I'm, I guess I would say this. I'm not ready to tell you uh, who they are or what they are, but I don't think I will be alone. Um, there's a change.org petition asking you be removed as a GOP member and or delegate. It has 16,000 signatures so far. Christopher, your response? Uh, if there's a link, I, I get those tweets all the time. People say, where can I sign up? I can't respond to them all, but I try and refer them to change.org. 
This is a great country. I am so glad I live in America where people have the First Amendment right to tell me they think I'm wrong. I'm okay with that. Fill out the petition. We'll go through the process. If there is a process to remove me, I'm going to oppose it, obviously. But that's how democracy works. That's how our First Amendment works. Well, Harvard law professor Larry Lessig has launched the Electors Trust to provide free and confidential legal support to any electoral college elector who chooses to vote his or her conscience. Lessig quotes Correct. Supreme Court Justice Robert Jackson, writing in 1952, saying, quote, "...no one faithful to our history can deny that the plan originally contemplated that electors would be free agents to exercise an independent and nonpartisan judgment as to the men best qualified for the nation's highest offices. Uh, and your response to that, Christopher Supran? Well, Mr. Lessig has reached out to me, uh, and I've been lucky enough to have him help represent me, and I believe he's going to be representing me going forward. But I agree with the statement completely. This is what the Electoral College fo is for, is so that we do not elect a demagogue, somebody who cannot uh, practice the foreign policy and national defense of the country appropriately, and one who has played uh, fast and loose with the rules uh, of conflicts of interest. Do you consider yourself a Hamilton elector? In the sense that I'm voting my conscience, absolutely. Did you ever think you'd be in this position, Chris? No. I, I'm an average person. Uh, I ran because, as you noted, I'm a paramedic firefighter. I responded to uh, the 9-11 event. For me, that was the last time our nation was united, united and unified. I wish we could get back to that point. Unfortunately, I see from Mr. Trump again and again attacks on First Amendment, attacks on his critics, like our steelworker friend in Indiana last night. Anyone who he doesn't believe uh, is appropriate or worthy or perhaps the right color, he attacks them. That's not America, and that's not what we want as a nation, I don't think. Well, I want to thank you for being with us, Christopher Supran, Republican presidential elector, one of the 538 people asked to choose officially the president of the United States. We'll link to your piece, said in The New York Times, why I will not cast my electoral vote for Donald Trump. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, we're going to talk about the recount, how it's going in Michigan, in Pennsylvania, in Wisconsin. Stay with us. Election time again. It's written in the manifesto that we'll do more than them, and we'll keep our word at least until we get to number 10. It'll cost you less in taxes if you mark your cross for us, and we'll deal with unemployment with a minimum of fuss. Vote for me, vote for me, I'm the one. Can trust you'll see. Play your part in democracy. It's election time again. We'll do the best on health for you. We'll cut out all the fat. We'll give you better teachers and simple things like that. And we'll get tough on scrounging. Vote for me, the election song by The Connections. And a big shout out to the students at Hunter College Media Studies Department, Farida CUNY, the City University of New York, who are here visiting today. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. On Wednesday, a federal judge ordered Michigan's Board of Elections to stop the state's electoral recount. U.S. District Judge Mark Goldsmith said he would abide by a court ruling that found that former Green Party presidential candidate Jill Stein could not seek a recount. Goldsmith concluded, quote, "...a recount as an audit of the election has never been endorsed by any court." Stein has pledged to continue to push for a recount. Michigan is one of three battleground states where Stein had demanded a recount. The other two states are Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. 
President-elect Donald Trump narrowly defeated Democratic presidential contender Hillary Clinton in all three states. The recount has faced hurdles from the outset. In Pennsylvania, the recount must wait at least until a federal court hearing on Friday, just four days before the December 13th federal deadline for states to certify their election results. In Wisconsin, the recount is more than 70 percent complete. Clinton has gained just 82 votes on Trump, who won the state by more than 22,000 votes. Meanwhile, in Florida, three voters have sued to demand a hand recount of the paper ballots, alleging the presidential election was skewed by hacking and malfunctioning voter functions, voter machines. Trump was declared the winner of Florida by more than 112,000 votes. To talk more about the recount, we're joined by John Boniface, attorney, political activist specializing in constitutional law and voting rights, one of a group of leading election lawyers and computer scientists calling for that recount in Wisconsin, Michigan and Pennsylvania. Boniface is founder of the National Voting Rights Institute and co-founder and president of Free Speech for People. Welcome to Democracy Thank Now! You, so Thank talk about me. the latest, what's happened in Michigan, the halting of the recount. Uh, last night, a federal judge halted the recount on the grounds that the state appeals court ruling uh, should stand, which found that Jill Stein, who's the presidential candidate seeking the recount in Michigan, is not an aggrieved party. This is a misreading of the state law. It's an outrage that the voters of Michigan will not have their votes properly counted. You know, the fact is, Amy, that in this country, we do not have mandatory audits in most states for verifying the vote. We're led to believe that the machine tallies on election night is what the outcome actually was. And we do not look at the ballots. Seventy-five percent of the electorate in this country uses paper ballots, but we never look at those ballots. And that's what was starting in the state of Michigan. We were doing a hand count in the state of Michigan, and it's been halted. And now we have 75,000 blank votes for president that will never be reviewed, with a 10,000-vote margin. It's an outrage for our democracy that we're not counting the votes. Can it be appealed? The problem here is that it's going to be appealed to the Michigan Supreme Court. This is a partisan decision made by the state appeals court, and these are judicial elections in the state of Michigan, and there are partisans on the Michigan Supreme Court. So while that appeal is pending, uh, you know, I think it's unfortunate that they may not take it up on a timely basis. Well, John, in Wisconsin, where the uh, the recount is almost 70 percent complete, Clinton has just gained 82 votes on Trump. Yes, but it's very important to note here that while some counties have agreed to hand count the ballots, other counties are not. They're feeding the ballots through the very same machines that gave us the tallies on election night. Ron Rivest, a leading computer scientist from MIT, says that's like going to the same doctor for a second opinion. It makes absolutely no sense to feed those same ballots through the machines and tell us that they're recounting the votes. What we needed in Wisconsin was a full statewide recount of all the ballots, hand-counted. And there are other systems in the state of Wisconsin, unlike in Michigan, that don't have any paper ballots. They're electronic voting systems, and they also exist in Pennsylvania. And these systems have been proven to be hackable and vulnerable for our overall integrity of our process. Last month, <clears throat> Democracy Now! spoke to leading cybersecurity and privacy research Bruce Schneier about the recount in Michigan, Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. There are anomalies in the results that seem to correlate with voting machine type. Now, that is a red flag for hacking and something we should look at, and we should definitely research this. My guess is it isn't. My guess is there's some confounding variable that the, the machine type is correlated to demographic in some way. But we don't actually know until we do the research. Uh, my worry right now is the recount. That process was designed decades ago, and it meant counting the ballots slower and more carefully. And it didn't mean looking at the voting machines for forensic evidence of hacking. So I'm not convinced that even after this recount, we're going to know more. That's privacy researcher Bruce Schneier, John Boniface. He, he's absolutely right that we need to be concerned about this, which is why tomorrow in Pennsylvania, in federal court, Stein's attorneys are going before a judge to make the case why voting machines should be examined. These election laws have been written long before these voting machines appeared on the scene. These voting machines appeared after the Florida 2000 election debacle. Private 
voting machine companies sold these systems to states throughout the country, and now they've been banned in many states. California did a top-to-bottom review of electronic voting systems and other voting systems and determined that these particular systems, voting machines where you touch on the screen your, your choices for, for president or any other office, that they, in fact, are vulnerable to be hacking, unreliable, untrustworthy, and should be banned altogether in the state of California. Yet Pennsylvania still uses them for most of their counties. Wisconsin uses them as well for some of their counties. And he's absolutely right that what we need when we engage in a recount is an examination of those machines. So far, that has not been granted, but that's exactly why there's a federal court hearing tomorrow on this. Well, Donald Trump's senior adviser, Kellyanne Conway, dismissed the recount efforts during an interview last month on Fox News. Their president, Barack Obama, is going to be in office for eight more weeks, and they have to decide whether they're going to interfere with him finishing his business, interfere no. with the peaceful transition, transfer of power to President-elect Trump and Vice President-elect Pence, or if they're going to be a bunch of crybabies and sore losers about an election that they can't turn around. That's Trump's senior advisor, Kellyanne Conway. So, John Boniface, can you talk about how Trump has been responding to this recount effort? The Trump campaign, the Republican Party, has showed up in every single one of these states to stop these recounts. You know, Nermeen, when I was involved in Ohio in 2004 in the recount there, the election officials in some parts of the state were friendly, and others, they were resisting uh, the recount in Ohio. But the Bush campaign and the Republican Party never showed up. They weren't involved in trying to stop that recount. That's very different here. The Michigan Attorney General, the Republican Party, were the ones who pushed for the stopping of the recount in Michigan. The Wisconsin Republican Party has pushed to stop it in Wisconsin. And in Pennsylvania, the Trump campaign and the Republican Party are showing up in federal court tomorrow to try to stop this case from going forward. What are they afraid of? What are they afraid of why we're going to count the votes and properly verify the process? In any functioning democracy, we should verify the vote. And it amazes me that we would want to have a cloud go over this election and continue into this next presidency without verifying the vote. We should be entitled, as voters, to ensure that the integrity of our process is, is protected. You know, there are two explanations for what happened on Election Day. One explanation is there was a huge hidden subset of voters who lied to the pollsters or chose not to respond to the pollsters, and they showed up on Election Day. That's believable or not believable, depending on where you sit, but it is one explanation. Another explanation, equally as believable or not believable, is that the election was compromised. And we ought to engage in verifying the vote to determine which occurred. The people of the United States have the right to know that. Well, there's a third explanation that people give, namely that there are a number of people who came out to vote who had not voted before, so they weren't even contacted by pollsters. You're absolutely right. There was uh, voter suppression that occurred prior to the election, but those who may have shown up and didn't get contacted by pollsters, that, that is an explanation. That's part of what I suggest may have been the hidden subset of voters. But we don't know, and we will never know if we don't verify the vote, which of the problems occurred. And we also know there was serious concern at all levels of the United States government about foreign interference in our elections leading up to Election Day. And then somehow we decide we're going to move on and not verify the vote after this election. It's amazing. You were one of the main um, figures who pushed Jill Stein to do this recount. Some have criticized it, saying, why are you just choosing the states where Hillary Clinton lost, the Clinton campaign supporting here what you're doing? Um, why? These were the three states with the closest margins of, of victory for Donald Trump. They were the three states where all the polls showing leading into Election Day would have a different result than was stated on election night. And I think, you know, if we had mandatory audits throughout the country, that would be far better. We ought to audit every election at every level throughout the country. But these were the three states that were the most concerning, given what had happened on election night. You know, I think the Clinton campaign should have come in and asked for these recounts. I'm congratulating the Stein campaign for having the courage to do that. But I think the Trump campaign should show up and support these recounts. We all, as Americans, ought to want to verify the vote. And finally, you just heard our conversation with the faithless elector. Overall, what would make you rest most easily um, when it comes to voting and how we choose our president? I think we need a lot of reforms to protect our democracy. The faceless electors is important 
uh, move that Mr. Super and others are making to vote their conscience, but it raises the other question of why we have this antiquated electoral college that allows somebody to become president when he was the loser to the popular vote. We have somebody who won 2.7 million more uh, votes than the than the declared winner, and you know this is uh, we need to abolish the electoral college. We need to get big money out of politics. We need to deal with gerrymandering. We need a lot of improvement. All hands on deck for fighting for our democracy. John Bonifaz, I want to thank you for being with us, founder of the National Voting Rights Institute, co-founder of President Free Speech for People. A very happy birthday to Carla Wills. Democracy Now produced by Mike Burke, Carla Wills, Laura Gutis, Dina Dina Gester, Sam Alcoff, Robbie Karen, Honey Masood, Trina Nadura, Andre Lewis, I'm Amy Goodman with Nermin Sheikh.